My job is a little bit different now, but I feel, and summing up, I feel that we gave the American farmers of this nation the biggest, fullest, com most complete package that they have ever been given in any period in history, and we did it in 24 hours' time. The speech that I made Wednesday night, I gave with confidence. I gave it with confidence because I knew what you were going to see yesterday. If I had not known and had not had confidence, I could not have made that speech Wednesday night because you would have thought that I misrepresented it to you here within 12, 14 hours later, wouldn't you? I gave it with confidence because I'm confident. And I've seen more confidence in talking to the delegates in the halls than I have seen in this organization since 1967. The only difference in this is the confidence, and I really couldn't say that there was that confidence then. I should have said enthusiasm in preparation for the milk holding action. This is a different kind of enthusiasm along with confidence. And I know that everything is not going to work perfect, but it's going to be all right 90% of the time. And I only ask you that if a program is not working, you know the directors of those departments. Don't wait an hour. Don't wait 10 minutes to start trying to get a hold of the directors of those departments and say what the problems are so that they can work on them and talk about the positive things of collective bargaining and our accomplishments, but more than our accomplishments, that we have the structure that can deliver us contracts based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Let's make that our prime conversation instead of that old cow that wasn't a cow turned out to be a small steer or something six years ago or eight years ago. Let's turn it around. Let's not live in the past, but let's think of today and tomorrow and work together like we've never worked together before. And now timing is so important. What do we do now? What are our priorities? And I heard some of the uh, jokes, I guess, around the hall. Boy, after listening to Staley, some of the older members saying, guess we don't have to do anything. Well, you wait a few minutes and you'll find it different. All we've got to do is to break up our responsibilities and each of us divide up and do certain things. We had a meeting with the young farmers last evening to talk to them about getting farmers their age as members of the NFO and getting them to get them to participate because they're with them, maybe every day or every few days. They have the influence. Now, what are the Pioneer members going to do? They can do the same thing. But we have what we feel are direct and responsible jobs that they have to do. One is we need the support of the rural business people in this country for the cause of rural America. And that's a certificate of support. And I want to say if you have questions on that or any other matter, 
You're not going to be able to get into our home office many times during the day, and it's better that if you don't try. Because as I understand, we handle 1,000 to 1,100 telephone calls a day in that office. And if you want information, that may keep us from conducting business. But I can tell you that at night, we will have somebody in every department as long as it seems that there's a people that are wanting information or instructions or to pass information on. And so after the hours of 6 to 6.30, because most of the departments are functioning till that late and they do come back every night, somebody's responsible. But everybody is willing to come back whatever time is necessary to give you the assistance so together we can do the job. How important is time and what are we going to do? We're going to ask the Pioneer members, because of their prestige and known in the communities for a long time, to contact the rural business people immediately on the certificate of support. And let's do that next week so we can do other things the following week. And then I challenged the staff last night in very direct terms at a meeting at midnight shortly thereafter in which I said I do not, cannot understand why a staff person traveling over the area cannot have at least come up with somebody or at least they know at least five farmers in the age bracket of 24 to 38 to 40 that they can bring in the corning. And you know, somebody asked, can we bring anybody older? I said, I don't care if somebody 98 years old drives a car in and brings a five with him, if they'll ride with him between 24 and 38, he's welcome to be there. <laughs> now, what point am I trying to say? I am trying to say to you, it's all right to slip in a guy maybe over 40 once in a while, but the ticket I want you to have as admittance is a carload of farmers 24 to 38 with you. And when are we going to do it? And why are we concentrating on the 24 to 38? You know, there are many reasons. One is, there really was a big gap of time in there that nobody stayed on the farm, wasn't it? We almost missed a generation of farmers, you know. And then the prices came up some, and now we've got some young farmers in there that are threatened to be driven from the farm in the next 90 days, the next 60 days. And I think that if there's one thing that you can leave here with is pride. You know the system and the structure that's put together that I believe we're all proud of wasn't put together in a day's time. It was put together over the years with hard work from you and all of us. But you know, a structure and a system is like a new tractor. If you never take it to the field, it's never going to be productive, is it? And now that the structure and the system is there, I'm trying to get across one point. Let's talk about the capabilities. Let's make that the byword of rural America 
And when there's problems and startups, instead of talking about those, what few there will be, let's keep the system and our goals of the cost of production plus a reasonable profit at the top of our minds and take care of the others as we come to them and immediately chase down that director of that department that you feel that there's something not being done right wherever it is in this nation. And failing to get that done, call for Orrin Lee Staley until, and they'll put the, the, the notices on my desk that a call has come in to return. If you can't get it, probably somebody will return it. And if they don't give you a satisfactory answer, you call Warren Lee Staley. I'm there most of the nights to 9 or 10 o'clock. And I enjoy to talk to you, to know what's going on. Now, what do we want to do and when do we going to do it? The certificates of support immediately. Staff will be assigned responsibilities. But the first step that we want to be sure is the farm age and group, and I'm stressing 24 to 38. Don't turn down 21 or 22 year old farmers, but in most cases, they have not been managing it long enough to be effective in influencing others their age. But that's not always true. It's fine to bring along some seniors in high school or just out, but concentrate on the others that have the most production right now. And you know, that's a job that we've got to depend on the pioneer members of this organization to do. At least get a car load to start, to bring in the Corning, where from. There are 17 states that we intend to cover completely, from Pennsylvania to the Rockies and from the Canadian border through much of Texas between now and the 10th day of January. And how are we going to cover them? What's our goal? At least five farmers in that age group, 24 to 38 in that home office, in every one of the counties in the states from the Pennsylvania line to the Rockies and from Minnesota to the Canadian border through most of Texas. And we're going to plot and keep a record of those farmers that have been in there, how many from each county, and who brought them. And that means if we have this one meeting in this county, a county wasn't covered, we're going to expect somebody to be responsible for covering that county that wasn't covered. And so what are we going to do? We're going to cram in somewhere between now and the 10th of January <coughs> five meetings. That will cover all of that 17 state area between now and the 10th day of January. And we're going to then try to work out transportation ways to get them in from the other outlying states throughout the United States. Why the Home Office? It seems as though from the reports that 50% and maybe 90% of the effect of proving to the young farmers that we do have the system, we do have the structure, we do have the manpower, we have the professional help, we have the systems, we have it all, 
that 50 to 90 percent and maybe even 100 percent of the first convincing is that they see it for themselves. And it comes back to believing is seeing, or seeing is believing. You can almost turn it around anyway. But to really believe, you have to see. And there's no substitute for it. So next week, on Thursday, we are going to ask that everybody from the states of Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa, and Kansas bring a carload of young farmers, 30, 24 to 38 or up to 40, into the home office next Thursday, December 15th. That is a week from yesterday. And then on Saturday, we're asking all of you from any of those states, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Illinois, Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, on up to South Dakota, North Dakota, from the Missouri then on, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. I don't believe I missed a state in that perimeter, did I? Oklahoma, I did miss. Oklahoma, very definitely included. Indiana, any other? Well, Montana's welcome to come, and I understand they're coming, and that's great. That will be a week from tomorrow. What's that date? What's the date on that? That's on Saturday, a week from tomorrow, on December the 17th. We will then make our announcements after we've had some plans, but we're going to have to come in with some more before Christmas. Now, why are we pressing? You know, people brought in next week I would say we'll have five times the effect of people brought in the middle of January. I'd say they'll have 50 times the effect of people brought in the first day of March and maybe a thousand times the effect of people brought in the last week in March. Because we're going to get them to bring more in. And then we'll work on the other states, working how to charter planes and all in from the other states across this country. Do you believe that if we accomplish that, that we'll turn this country upside down by the middle of January? Do you believe that now is the time for collective bargaining? You know, there's no reason that as long as there's an ounce of breath in anybody, that they're not good for one last round, you know. Muhammad Ali is proving it every fight, you know, once in a while. And what I want to say is that I want to mass I think you want to mass and I know agriculture must have it massed. The greatest drive of the age of all farmers to show this country, backed up by the promise of credit committees, as a temporary gap, that the farmers of this nation are rallying and mobilizing their production, young, old, and everybody in between, 
doing their job to say that the farmers of this nation are not going to be pushed off the land. They aren't even going to be pushed around anymore. It's the priorities we establish. You see, we can't very well have it over all that country that I talked about next Thursday because they won't hardly have time to get there and get back, would you? But in between, we can have the four states, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri. And if some of the rest of you want to come in, fine. But you know what? We expect Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri to be back on Saturday with another group because they're not that far away. Now that's work, isn't it? Well, how many of you, and I hope all the wives that can can come, but don't use that as an excuse because the wife can't come either, that the men don't come, you know. But how many of you, in the time of planting or harvest, have laid everything else aside and done nothing but plant, nothing but harvest? We all have, haven't we? We do it every year, twice in a year, don't we? Twice in a year we do it. Now I don't know what you're going to plant or what you're going to harvest between now and about the middle of March. But I'll tell you the old saying, what you soweth, you also reap. And if you don't sow any seeds, there's not going to be any harvest for cost of production contracts plus a reasonable profit. I could go on and repeat and repeat. But I believe that the pioneer members and every member of the NFO that joined today or yesterday can thank the Lord that there is a structure that can deliver collective bargaining and a structure that gives them a chance to fight for survival. And all that I can say is this, you are the ones that are going to make the decisions. But even with the cutback in the crowd, and if you've talked to delegates throughout this convention, this would have set by far all records, I'm sure, of any convention. It's been a great convention. We've had a good crowd. But just for the people in this auditorium right now, if everybody pledged that they're going to bring five young farmers, 24 to 38 to 40, into Corning, Iowa, Next week, just in the areas I named, it'll be the biggest kickoff of a drive for fairness and justice this country's ever seen. And I can't speak for yourself or for you. I can only speak for myself. And that is I'm a little edgy. You know what I'm edgy about? I want to get into the battle and show the farmers can really do it and we can say this is our production. You don't get it if you don't pay our price and our contracts. And I want you to help us do it starting next week. And I don't want you to let up until we've turned this country upside down. And I mean upside down for the farmers of this nation and for their survival and their welfare. We've got the structure. Let's go and let's do it. Let's don't put it off.
Next, it gives me great pleasure to introduce in the specialty department the gentleman from <coughs> the northwest part of the United States, attend Washington State University, and has had a lot of experience in the NFO. And now the one commodity that we have reached uh, approximate 10 percent of a nation's total production, and it's not a small commodity, and that's sunflowers that comes under the specialty department. And there's a little over a million acres that's uh, produced in sunflowers over the United States, and they have, uh, will have, uh, if not already have completed, about 10 percent of those acres being delivered through NFO and most of it for export in sunflowers. And that's been a tremendous job that has been accomplished, as well as some other programs that they have going. <coughs> this time, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Shelley Robertson. Thank you, Arne Lee. Uh, what we're going to discuss for just a few minutes is how you react to markets and then how that can be used either for or against you. But as I was sitting here just a moment ago listening to Bill, a thought came to me, and I want to share it with you. It'll take just a couple of minutes, but I think that each one of you in here are going to be personally interested in it. Yesterday, we had the French with us from France, the first time they'd been here. And last evening, as we were seeing them off on the plane, we asked them, what did you think of America, and was it like what you thought, or was it different? And it was such a profound statement came from them that I think you ought to know about it. They said, we think it's the most important thing that we came over here and met with the American farmer. And I said, why? And they said, because he's not at all like we've been told that he is in Europe. And I said, how is that? And they were very reluctant to tell me to begin with. But finally they did, and they said, we're told that you have Cadillacs and airplanes, but more importantly, that you're a very stubborn and uh, demanding people from your government and that if you don't get what you want uh, uh, one way, you'll insist on it some other way. Well, you see, they had the opportunity yesterday afternoon to actually rub elbows personally with our members. And I pointed out to them, I said, these people you're rubbing elbows with were the very best to come off the land. And you didn't see them driving Cadillacs, and you didn't see them in new suits. You saw them with the best they had. And they said, that's what convinced us. And I think that we had the best piece of public relations work done right then, you people mixing with them, that we could have, because we were none of us aware of this opinion. And I just wanted to share it with you for a moment for you to realize that there's side effects that come from everything we do that are very beneficial. <laughs> to begin this discussion now this afternoon, first we have to uh, look and analyze your marketing habits and see what it is that are your goals and see how those are affected. Isn't it the fact that we all try to sell 100% of what we raise at the top of the market? Don't we sit and watch the market and wait until it gets to the top so we can sell everything we have in one, at one time? I know you do it because I've held enough of these meetings and asked that question enough that I've always got an affirmative answer. I do it myself, and always have. Well, let's analyze that on the overhead. Will someone kill the lights, please? Would someone kill the lights, please? Thank you. All right, as the market goes up, what do we do as farmers? We hold, don't we? And why do we hold? Hoping for the market to go higher. How do we know when it hit the top of the market? when it goes down. Yeah, it, it's funny to laugh at right now, but you never think about it until you draw it out and look at it. And that's why we're doing it. So we try to sell 100% of our production at the top of the market. And already we've discovered that there's no way we can do that, that we're going to sell on the down market. And we just held a class in Corning this last week, and I learned something that I didn't know. I discovered that only 3% ever sell on an up market, and those are forced sales. That 7% sell in this area here on the down market, but 90% sell 
as it bottoms. Well, if that's the kind of a marketing theory you uh, have habit to or committed to, it sounds pretty unpredictable, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, it is unpredictable, and because of this pattern, the trade has developed a system to get the production when they need it because they know that they can't get it otherwise. And so as the market goes up, they know you will hold, and when it breaks sharply, they know you'll start selling. If they don't get enough production the first time they do this, they'll again run the market up and break it, and again they'll get production. This is known as milking. We milk the production out when we need it. Well, there is a better way, and we have an answer for it, but let's analyze what the trade does while you're holding. And it's important to realize what they're doing so you can see the solution to it. As the market's going up, they know they're not going to be able to buy anything because all the farmers are going to hold. Looks like that's a little wet yet. Let me dry it out a little more. There we go. All right, as the market goes up, they know that you're going to hold. And so it's during that period of time that they do their contracting. That's why they're called a trade. They buy and they sell. They don't use it themselves. Cargill, Continental, and everybody else that's considered a trade does this. So they make a contract here promising that they're going to deliver a quantity of grain at this price, or cattle, or whatever. And as the market continues up, they continue to make contracts. Then when it gets to a level that they feel is high enough, they break it knowing that because of the greed that was created in your holding, and that's what it is, you, you hold for one more nickel, it creates panic when the market breaks, and this is what causes you to sell. And so you start selling here and here, and most especially here. So you see, if they sold a contract at that level and picked up the production for it at that level, that difference right there would be profit. The whole system is so designed that Everybody is after a down market because that's what you make money on. Well, what is the solution to that? As the market goes up, there's a price established, and the trade makes a sale here. Then the NFO members, understanding that they should be selling on an up market rather than holding on it, sell also. So they sell at the same price as this contract was made. And this circle denotes our production around the X. Now, if a man bought the product for $4, that's the trade bought it, Cargill bought it for $4, how can he sell it at $4 and make a profit? He can't. He has to take this circle of production that we sold him and move it up to $4.10 to get his profit. But if we again come in and sell additional production to him at the level of 410, what does he have to do with that production? He again has to raise it, doesn't he? And so on. Well, as we draw this out, you say, well, if that's so, Shelley, this would go on forever. And it just about does. Remember 72 and 73, when we sold three of the largest crops that we'd ever raised that were already in storage? I said that wrong. We sold three of the crops that were in storage plus one it was the largest we'd raised at that time, which made four crops. So the greatest production had ever been, and the price kept going up. The reason was that people were buying at levels and had to raise the price so they could get their profit. And finally, it came to a halt. What were some of the things that caused the halt in 72 and 73 to stop this process from going on? Well, first, they had to stop sales. And if you'll remember in wheat specifically, the first thing that happened was that uh, they got together with the Miller's Association and started talking about dollar bread. The next thing was that they started bringing wheat in from Canada. The third thing was, and one that you're very aware of, was that they reviewed the contracts and wouldn't allow soybeans to go to Japan, stopping the sales of the movement. And then finally, the one that we're always well aware of is embargoes. Well, there's many more ways that you can stop this sale. I can stop this sale if I get on as an accounting extension agent or anyone that reports the market and say, gentlemen, because we had such a high winter kill in hogs last year, you don't need to worry this winter or this next spring, and that they said that last spring, you won't need to worry because the price is going to go up. What did it do? 
It went down because everyone held. Nobody had to raise the market to make their profit. All right, so we come up to put a floor on this price at the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that simple. It is so because three weeks ago I was in Minneapolis and met with traders up there and I drew this on a table napkin while we were having lunch and I didn't have one man argue with me on it. Not one man. So I knew I was absolutely correct with it. The amazing thing is, is that we stumbled onto this several years ago and didn't realize it. When I used to interview uh, uh, t uh, professional people out of the fields of bargain and grain, it was a long involved process on how we were to raise the market through collective bargaining. And one evening at six o'clock, it was very late and I was tired. And I thought, how can I do this? Because normally it takes two hours. And so I turned to him and I said, we raise the market the exact opposite way that you lower it. He sat there and thought for about five minutes and he said, you know, it'll work. That's how we come on to this. And this is a presentation that we're giving our young farmers that come to Corning every week. And Orrin Lee and everybody has looked at it and thought that you ought to have an opportunity to see it also. I ask you this final question. Can you think of a better way to raise prices than this? NFO needs your production and you need NFO. Thank you. Next, the department we talked about there, and we probably should have been a little more explicit in the hogs. In a 14 week period, the volume increased 80%. Coming into this convention here and adding two, but coming into this convention with three contracts that they have that they have just renewed with major packers. In fact, the biggest in the hog industry included. And now another large independent packer that will be the contract representing a good big volume increase per week. Also in the cattle, I haven't said it today, but I said it Wednesday night, about a 70% increase in the last month over the previous months. Taking out the week of Thanksgiving, I uh, have to calculate that, but the other three weeks have averaged out about a 70% over what we had been having for a long time. Stockers, of course, are showing a big increase, but the hog increase also, we want to talk about is 80% increase in 14 weeks, and with additional contracts that have to be met, there's a great job being done in the hog division. The director of that is hard working, has had a lot of experience in the NFO, had experience in other fields, is putting together a team of professional people to assist. And I want to be sure that everybody understands when we're talking about the additional professional people that we've employed, that really, folks, they're not replacing people, they're just addition to the team, addition to the team that we need. And there's got to be a lot more additions as we go along. But these people have the know-how and they have people that they know that they've worked with, that you get the production and the, and the money behind the organization, we'll get all the top professional people in this country that we need. And I've told you many times in conventions that my goal was to build the best staff in America. And I told you not just one convention, but several conventions. And I believe that that has happened now. And I think that staff has proven itself at this convention in your very eyes, as you've seen them present their commodity department reports to you out in the commodity meetings. Because that's more detailed and more understanding than they can get in a few minutes into a presentation here. I'm glad to present to you the director of the Hog Division, Alan Skrull. Thank you, Arne Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got with me just before we get into the report here, 
I got the returns of the display that the department had set up here in the, in the back room. Some of you may be interested. We'll put it together in a little story and probably put it in the reporter so you'll have a copy of it. But I'll give you just a brief synopsis of it. The pen number one that had the out hogs in, uh, you had one hog in there that was condemned. One hog yielded 70.5%. Uh, one yielded 73.8% and one yielded 62 percent. Now we'll be figuring out the total dollar value uh, as that comes back uh, from the packer. Pen number two, the average yield was 78.3. 78.3 on pen number two. On pen number three, the average weight was 216.7. So those of you that were, were working on the, on the hog thing, uh, there, that was the returns from there. The prizes that we had uh, given away, if you uh, won one and didn't pick it up, it will be mailed to you uh, off the uh, card that you had so we can look at it uh, from that point of view and you can, you'll get it in your mailbox. Now, before we get into the hog program, because we're going to uh, do something here uh, today, before we leave the convention, I want to introduce the uh, staff that has been working with me that made it possible to develop the program as far as we have, and it's also going to be the staff that uh, we're going to uh, go with on down the road uh, from here on out. So at this point in time, I want to introduce the staff to you. They're a little bashful. Okay, the young lady here is Betty Poor, who works in the home office. Uh, the next gentleman is Walter Broughton, who is in the home office, uh, came to us from Gold Belt Swine. Roger Blank, who came to us with 28 years of experience in the industry, uh, representing uh, various uh, areas of work. Cecil Conroy, who is working out here in eastern Iowa. Pete Rushing, who works the Georgia area. John Garland working southern Indiana, part of Kentucky. Uh, Gene Henning, who is working out of Omaha as a grader out uh, in the Nebraska area. Clarion Hansen working in the Sioux City, uh, that general area up there. And that's this guy right here. Uh, Bob Peterson, the man that was responsible to put the display together with the hogs working the, uh, in the corning area, Stanton Stringtown. Lloyd Rofing working in central Missouri. He's the man that'll be going out to work with the Ohio, Indiana, Michigan people as we put together a professional staff to handle that area and give us the assistance we need. And I'll tie that into the program here in a minute. Bill Talbert, one of our supervisors, uh, will be working the eastern Iowa, southern Minnesota corner of Wisconsin. Dave Chase working Kentucky uh, in that general area. Mace Mace working southern uh, Minnesota, and Merle Sunken, who will be working in the home office, also working as a supervisor in the country. These people will be out here someplace, uh, posted by the doors at the hog booth, because I'm going to have a job for them to do before they leave. Also, I want you to know where they are, because I'm going to ask you to do something. Okay. I think every one of them is a professional. They are. They're good. And believe you and me, if you push them a little bit, you can really get to work on them. So I'm real proud of them. Okay, let's get into the... Uh, could we have the lights dimmed a little bit? Let's get into the uh, cost, of, uh, cost of production plan. I have here a... a uh, transparency, a nationwide plan for hog producers to receive a cost of production under contract. Back some uh, 1976, we started with a commitment to bargain. We put the three to four million head of hogs on that commitment to bargain, but that was an inventory of people that believed it could happen. They had the feel that it was going to happen. They had the guts to put their hogs on there, and they're really the ones that started it off. From there, we turned into the negotiated interim supply contracts, and we have introduced in the hog meeting 
a hog contract for NFO members. It's exclusive and unique to the members of this organization. In that NFO hog contract for NFO members, there will be a cost of production formulation that we're going to be working off of. How fast we get to that point is going to depend on us and what we do when we leave this group or this convention. Please turn this tape over to side number two. Now at this point in time, we're here. That's where you are. You're over halfway. You're on the downhill run because the next step is the cost of production and you notice there's no timetable on that one. Now, in order to make this work, the program has got to be totally adaptable to about any type of hog operation. And our purpose, <clears throat> our purpose in uh, organizing this thing is to provide a flexible marketing option for you. Hog contracts for NFO members. NFO negotiators have negotiated written and verbal contracts for NFO members to consider in their marketing plan. The flexibility of those agreements is sufficient that you could adapt them to any type of hog operation there was. Believe it or not, the program even handled pen number one. You know the pen we had out here? Yeah, we got them taken care of. At this uh, next option, the live merit sales program, is you have a greater assisting you as a producer in the determination of which way his hog should go to market to return the most dollars to him. With the knowledge that we have built into the program, I believe that we can put together, as far as strictly marketing your hogs, I think we can put together the best program this country has ever seen. I'm going to give you one short example here in a minute but it's got to return the most dollars to you. That's what it's all about. This board of directors didn't hire me to run your hog department for any other reason than to get you a contract under cost of production. This staff you looked at was here for no other reason than to get you the most dollars for your hogs that is humanly possible. Now, the Great and You program the grader assists the producer in determining what type of hogs will give the best results on a grade and yield. Normally, you can have a wide range, but if you uh, put your, uh, narrow your range down, then uh, it'll work better. But that's what he's there for. That's why, go to that collection point, ask him how to handle that. Another program that's available to uh, our producers is forward contracting. It allows the producer the flexibility to lock in a predetermined price on his hog that he has on the farm without having to put up money for margins or margin calls. It's a true hedge. You lock in the price that you're, uh, you can contract. Uh, you lock in the predetermined price for those hogs three, four, five, six months, whatever, down the road. Our staff will assist you in designing a total marketing, marketing and bargaining program that will fit your operation. That's basically the program. In other words, raising hogs in this day and age is a, a very individual, highly specialized endeavor. And that program has got to be adapted to that man's operation. Our challenge to the producers in this audience is to commend you for the efficiency in breeding and production and ask you to extend that efficiency into the marketing and bargaining area. Because I'm going to show you a, an example which doesn't have any particular merit as far as any contract or any price relationship is concerned, but I want you to recognize this and I challenge you to go down to your local buyer and have him show you the same figures. Here you see a live base, one to three, normal consist, 100 head at 220 pounds, $22,040 plus 50, $8,910 extended out. A one to three blend, normal consist, approximately 60% uh, ones and twos, 40% number threes, it's a, a normal consist. It's the method that we have used for a long time. Now, 
we have come to what we call the life merit program. Here is the key. You take those 20 head of number ones, and you have the ability to put a plusing factor on them. They will cut that many more primal cuts. They'll return the dollars in the meat, and we're going to return it to the producer. The difference between the 9,000 here, when you put your grades together, and the 8,900 here is $110. That's called the margin. That usually went into the buyer's pocket, or it went into the, into the packing company if it has to happen to be a company buyer. But because of their failure to do this, or because of the, the buying industry's failure to do that, that money was put into the coffers of the plants, into the pockets of the, of the order buyers, and as a result, you've seen some, some uh, very rich people develop from farming to farmers again. At any rate, when it's all said and done, the total gross sales to the buyer minus the total gross payments to the member balance out to zero. You get paid all of the margin. There's no, no margin that comes off of that, other than your, your service charge, which covers your packer insurance, it covers your collection points, and uh, the other parts of the program. Now, I'm going to lay out the plan to accomplish cost of production 1978. It's simple. It doesn't take a whole lot of time or imagination to understand what I'm going to tell you. It takes a little courage because when you stop and think that you're going to have to generate millions of dollars of business per day, the thought is almost staggering. It's awesome. What's a million dollars? You go out here on your way home this evening or tomorrow, whatever the case may be, and you drive across miles and miles and miles of country. How do you organize an agricultural plant that large? The method that we're going to use is a, is a structure that we put together here. It looks something like this. And I'm going to kind of work through this in just a little bit, and then I'm going to show you a simple way to do it. This one is complicated. We start out with the six supervisors assigned to supervisor 40 manager. The managers are the staff people that are assigned to work with the collection point committees, with the people running the collection point, with the meat committees, at each of five collection points. They're, they should be there every day that that collection point runs to work with the producers. We team that manager up with a grader to give that member the professional assistance to have equal knowledge on the side of the seller that the buyer has. You've seen many examples of that. When you sell hogs once, twice a month, how do you compete with a man that buys them 10 and 15 times a day? Well, the way you compete is to take a grader, work him from collection point to collection point, so he's doing the same type of work, and then you run him through a, uh, run him into the plant and work right with him in the plant so that he can represent your hogs right. Now, those five collection points would have an average of four counties delivering to each collection point, and you take that four counties times the 200 collection points currently in the system, that would give you 800 county hog coordinators working in the country. Now we want every county. Two years ago, in the, in the annual report, I said we needed a county uh, hog coordinator in every county. Some things happened that we couldn't pursue on that. We're going back to that program. But before you leave this convention, I want every county president to go past that hog booth and get a county hog coordinator for your county. The staff will assist you there, but make no mistake about it. If we're going to go to the wall, if we're going to price them at cost of production, it's going to take the horses, not the ponies. It's going to take the horses, and it's going to take a good horse in every county because he's got to work out a workable program of one load per week minimum. One load per week, uh, projecting it out, you see here 160,000 head of hogs per week coming out of, the, out of those counties. If you worked alongside of that, 
you'd have 320,000 head of hogs coming out of those counties. That would figure out somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the hogs in the United States. Now, there isn't a county president worth his salt that can't get that done. Because I know that every county president here knows a man in that county that'll do it. There's eight cents a hundred defray uh, car or expense money that he can use to defray his phone calls, some of his gasoline and that. Now, if you don't want the money, take it in a way. But you take it and you'll go down to the florist and you buy your wife a dozen roses every week. That's right. You won't have to worry too much then about having her answer the phone. Might even take her out to dinner. It amounts to $32 a trailer load that you put together with your committee. Or those people are to recruit township hog coordinators to work with them or the hog committee. Maybe you want to take the, take the $32 and have a, a weekly or a monthly meeting of the hog committee. Have a dinner. But at any rate, take the money and use it. It's part of our budget. Uh, we want you to use it because, well, it's, you're entitled to it. Okay. If we go one more step further here, we take these 8,800 township coordinators or your hog committee. These should be producers. Each person brings one more producer. Now everybody at least got one friend. Well, I think so. Well, if he's, if he's got one, by default, folks, you have 30% of the hogs in your organization, in your own structure. Man, ain't that something? Look at that. Well, you can't even see it. By default, 19,200 people. Where does the figure come from? Big America, who some of you heard a representative say a few words in the hog meeting, reported 50,000 commercial hog producers in the United States, raising about 87 to 95 percent of all the hogs. 30 percent of 50,000 producers is 15,000. You're a vanishing breed. You're going to go by the wayside if we don't get this job done, unreal but true, in your own structure. Tell you something else. There ain't a self-respecting hog producer in this convention hall that can't go home and do the same thing. <laughs> Boys, we're going to go to the wall in 1978 and price hogs at cost of production. Any way you cut it, that's the direction she is going to go. We've got a plan. We've got a program that's adaptable to everyone's operation but we have got to have the courage to take it there. Now, I'm going to show you the simple way to do it. Some of you in the hog meetings seen this happen, but let me take and give you an example. Going through the, going through the hog meeting, we had approximately 3,000 people that walked through those doors. We counted every meeting for Monday morning. 3,000 people. Now these are all hog producers, or we're going to assume they're all hog producers. And I don't know, they, hog producers generally have that, that smell of money about them, you know. Some, <laughs> some of these grain farmers hadn't experienced this convention. Man, you wouldn't think that all that grain would smell that bad, would you, after you processed it? <laughs> think about that. Well, we had approximately 3,000 people go through those hog meetings. We'd had a lot more if we'd had some decent weather, and there's another storm moving in out uh, east again. But these people, because of their charming personality, ought to be able to get by people. You know that? 
I don't think there's a hog producer in this convention hall that can't do that. Now, five times 3,000 is 15,000. What do you think? Should I make reservations at Vets Auditorium in Des Moines next week? The staff that I introduced is going to be out at the hog stand. There'll be some guys at the doors. They're going to ask for names of people that will bring five hog producers into a meeting. When those people have on their list enough names to price hogs, there will be a meeting called. We're that close. At that point, we're going to go to the final step, and I'll put it right over your structure. That's the easy way to do it. There you've got it. You're at the interim supply contract point now. Yesterday, on the stage in your hog meeting, you had the world's largest independent packer, Frederick Harry, Detroit, Michigan, kills 15,000 head a day in that plant in Detroit. You had the world's largest major packer with nine plants killing approximately 10 to 12 percent of the nation's hogs. Joining him in the middle of the course of the meeting was another packer, which is third or fourth in the realm of things, another eight to 10%. You had roughly 20 to 25% of the kill capacity represented, not by buyers, but by head procurement people and executive vice presidents on the stage in the hog meeting. The one man that was invited to the convention but not to speak he stayed over, met with me last night after the staff meeting. We talked until about 2.30, 3 o'clock. We started conversing about 9 o'clock this morning, and he wants a supply at every one of his plants. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that happened since yesterday afternoon. Now, the question is, do we have the courage to cause that to happen. You've seen the horses that are gonna take the front front line. They're gonna they're gonna take her straight on the nose. But boys, we have to be behind them, or we as producers won't get it done. They'll take the beating. I will go against the presidents of these companies and against their chief honchos. I'll design the program. We'll make it work but I need them horses behind it because when you start tacking this thing here on a $3.2 billion business, you're talking about establishing a cost of production from coast to coast on hogs. It's going to take the horses. It's going to take those 3,000 people bringing that carload of producers. I want every county president that's here, every leader, when they get back to call a meeting of two or three of the top hog producers in that county. Show them those statistics. This is all you have to show them. That you, you want 3,000 people that are willing to bring a carload of people to Des Moines, Iowa, to Vets Auditorium, or maybe here, or someplace. When we have that list compiled, you have the structure to cause it to happen. At that point, we'll be able to take this chart and take these question marks off of there because I don't know. It's that close. So to summarize what I have said, our goal as a department is to develop a cost of production contract for all of the NFO member hog producers. Our goal also is to do it in 1978 because I think it is about time that we as an organization brought this thing to a climax. I've been involved with 
the organization for about 12 years, and I was of the conclusion that it could have been done, you know, we've all a couple days, three, four days. Now, I'm asking that these people come to Des Moines. I have told the industry I was doing this. I've also gone so far as to say that when we get ready with this program and we go to Des Moines, I am going to have a man in every major company in this country. And we're going to write cost of production. We can do it next week, we can do it the week after, or we can do it six months from now. But we're going to do her in 1978. Thank you. Now it gives me great pleasure to present a man that has been with us a long time, that has given such great study and devoted and complete leadership in the organization. One that fought quite a battle for quite a while on the health front and had open heart surgery about three months ago or somewhere thereabouts and is so vigorous and got so much vitality now that we're all sort of envious of him but putting together a staff and administering it and bringing in additional people to help is a man that so many of you know and respect and is also getting the key markets in dairy and I know he'll talk about it, but in just from the Minnesota line to Texas, through the, those states just in between and bordering on, right now we need 42 million pounds a month more grade A milk than we've got to meet just the contracts we already have and many more to come. And the key in dairy is getting the key markets so you don't have to haul out of the area. And now, instead of doing it piecemeal, we're taking over a market at a time, an outlet at a time, backing up then the supply to take over the next one. And so, the man that's meant so much to the organization, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Ed Groff, Director of the Dairy Department. Thank you, President <clears throat> Staley, members of the Board of Directors, delegates and friends. I'm going to lead off by giving you what I think has been a typical contrast in how we've lived and how we've tried to produce and what people have said and what we're doing. About a month ago, a young dairy farmer from Wisconsin, I think, said it all when he came to Corning, Iowa, and he said, we can no longer meet our obligations and pay our debts on $9 milk. This man milks 200 cows, so he's not someone that has a sideline in dairy. Another Nebraska farmer was reported to me milking 175 cows, says, you know, we really haven't made much gains in the last 15 years when it comes to pricing the commodities. And I looked back to see what really has happened with all the talk about parity and prices, and in 1963, 15 years ago, dairy farmers were receiving 78 percent of parity, and in 1976, at the last available figures, it was 76 percent. We didn't gain, we lost, really. And I like to add that when we had 78 percent of parity, we even had 125 billion pounds of milk produced that year compared to 120 billion in 76. So, of course, if the supply and demand process were working with the great numbers of people we have, it shouldn't be this way. And then I thought about ahead to 1990. What would it be 15 years from now unless this organization is successful and the farmers are successful in helping themselves? But there's somebody else that takes a much brighter view of this. That's why we've been fooled. At almost that exact time, the date was November 7th, 1977. The headlines came out in the largest dairy producing state in the United States, Wisconsin. 
Dairymen are celebrating 82.3% of parity at that particular time. The state dairy cooperative leaders celebrate in Madison today. It wasn't the farmers at all. And down below, this is what they were celebrating. In contrast, wheat prices currently are at 43% of parity. Corn at 46 and soybeans at 63%. They were celebrating the low prices that someone else is getting in agriculture. And I know exactly what they could have written in that article. I know what they're telling the dairy farmers, to feed this cheap grain now and produce more milk. And I'd like to have them standing right here today and have them defend that position if they'd only think about it for a little bit. One farmer attempting to get ahead at the expense of the other and eventually getting back to all of us because they know that that's going to drop the price of milk even though it's only at 82 percent that particular month. I want you to keep in mind while I'm speaking in this short period of time that all the things that I'm going to talk about, we were doing something in the background that we weren't really making a lot of fuss about or trying to hit the headlines. I want you to think back. And I'm going to make a statement that the NFO can easily affect the price on milk. The NFO members, we can affect the price. But we've got the step to take to stabilize the prices also. And that takes, of course, the production from a lot more farmers, putting it together, which we hope will come following this convention. In 1967, we all remember the milk holding action. The results were of that holding action, the recognition we got, but also something else. The Secretary of Agriculture went out and held what he termed shirt sleeve meeting. And they eliminated a price drop that was supposedly to take place. And along came an increase in, in price shortly after that, instigated because there was an uprising. And who had that milk holding action? It was the NFO. We affected the price. In 1970, Two little things happened in the background. One was a milk reload opened in Stoughton, Wisconsin, and one in Mountain Grove, Missouri. Just two. In 1972 through 74, the NFO again said, we'll affect the price of milk. And in order to do that, with the numbers we had, we said we have to make somebody else beat our price. So we put milk together and we moved milk from one buyer to another. Sometimes it was merely a movement of milk from a buyer on one side of the road to the other. Sometimes it was moving it completely out of the area because we had something in mind, and that was to affect the price of milk over the entire nation. And we knew we were going to do that by affecting the Minnesota-Wisconsin series price, which is the base price. There are where your prices are established in the federal orders across the entire United States. Now, could it be done? Could NFO farmers really do that? <clears throat> From the time records were kept, in 1960, on the Minnesota-Wisconsin series price, so the base price of milk, we had never seen that price continuously go up month after month after month for a year's period of time. Could the NFO make it happen? We tried to. <clears throat> we moved this milk in various patterns. The series price always moved. We moved it some more, it moved again. And we came out and said, beat the NFO price. We challenged the industry, and they obliged, they did. There were some farmers that thought they were taking advantage of something by not coming with us because they went for that nickel or that dime or that 15 cents more. But do you know that that's the only time in history that the Minnesota mi uh, series price moved for 22 months in a row? Through the flush periods of production, 
It made no difference. It kept right on going. And we told them that that's what we were going to do. So we affected the price then. You all remember what happened shortly after that when the imports hit us, where they imported one year 55 million pounds of butter. The one product that they said is the dairyman's problem, too much butter. They imported 55 million pounds, along with 266 million pounds of not non-fat dry milk, or almost 23% of the total consumption. And what happened? The old leadership used this and marketed and sold it, and our prices started dropping down again. They dropped so seriously that in February, or in December of 1975, the price of butter dropped 27 and a half cents. In two weeks, could NFO do anything about it? Well, one thing happened that President Staley sent a telegram to John Rainbolt, who was the vice chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And he said, I want an immediate investigation on the pricing structure and what's going on in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. There's no reason for this butter price to be dropping. And all you grade A producers, you just remember that the butter price affects the MW series price, and the MW series price affects your class one price. So it was done to help all farmers throughout the nation. Well, that telegram itself resulted in the next week, the butter market went up five and a half cents. Here one man affected it by doing something knowing that there was strength behind it, and it came out in the Chicago Tribune. The following week, the spot cash butter market of the Mercantile Exchange, under fire by a farmer's group, the National Farmers Organization, charging the market is rigged, has asked the commission to investigate the price decline. Consequently, butter prices went up five and a half cents. Well, we did more than that. This is the interesting one. Can you affect prices? Is there anybody here that remembers the meeting held in Darlington, Wisconsin? near Darlington, out at a bowling alley, and we said we're going to stop the drop in the price of milk. And we called in farmers from the neighborhood, and we had 493 there that one day, and we talked to them in groups of about 30 at a time. We announced on the radio that the NFO was going to stop the drop in the price of milk. Could we be successful? Do you think there's a chance we could be? We printed flyers, and on that flyer it said, Dairyman, if you can take a drop in your milk price of a dollar and a half, a hundredweight by spring 1976, you don't need to read this. Well, they read it, and they came to the meeting, and we said we're going to stop the drop, and farmers came with us, and we started to move milk out of the normal patterns again. Did it work? You don't have to just take my word for it. In May, the special, the Dairy Extra, the farm forecast out of the Farm Journal, it said milk prices made a spasmodic lurch back toward the season high as the Minnesota-Wisconsin price series upon which the fluid prices are based moved from February's eight and a quarter to 860, all in the face of increasing supplies, heading into the flush it embarrassed just about everyone in USDA. NFO said they were going to do it. They went out, they put a program together, and the results were there again. The prices went up in the face of everything where you thought perhaps we couldn't be effective. At that point, I happen to think the way farmers market today is under an auction system. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the headlines in the Time magazine about this period of time, it says how they affect prices, the Mercantile Exchange, and how they keep food prices down. And with us unorganized, we're the ones that suffer that brunt. So they buy on an auction system. We sell on an auction system. And we're all farmers sitting here today. How many of you have ever gone to an auction to see how much you could pay? Or did you go to see how cheap you could buy? Why do you think the industry would be any different? 
That's why we're in the mess we're in. But we're coming into something else. I know that at this time, our opposition has used a tool convincing farmers that the NFO is lacking something in marketing or lacking something in getting the top price. And I also know this, a statement that Gene Potter made, that it's not necessarily what the facts are, it's what they, the farmers think the facts are that regulates their minds and makes them make some of the decisions they do. And if they're not knowledgeable, it's what they think the facts are. So many people think that the NFO probably doesn't have the expertise or know what they're doing in marketing. Well, we have come to the conclusion and mounting evidence that I need cooperation in from this convention. I know that we printed up 10,000 little cards that were lying in the dairy booth down here and were handed out in very small amounts to various delegates. I'm going to tell you what I want done with those cards at the end of this convention. Now let me show you why I want it done. If you dim the lights, please, I'm going to stress the big ripoff that's been going on in the dairy industry. I got a letter in the mail one day with these figures printed on it with names written along the side of each one of those figures and they represent the test, the butterfat test that these producers were getting right here prior to coming with NFO and right here after they, be after they started shipping their milk with NFO. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I didn't know it was this apparent, that there was this much going on. Remember what I said, the dairy farmers sometimes think this is a fact when they see a high base price on their milk check. This man was receiving a 2.4 test, 2.5, Notice when he came with NFO, what the test went to on the opposite column. This one here is a full point, or ten-tenths of a point, which am, and a tenth of a point amounts to 11.6 cents on 100 pounds of milk. So if the price here on this test, the base price, was $8 a hundred weight on milk, it meant that with a test like that, he was being ripped off a dollar and sixteen cents a hundredweight. And the smallest ripoff that I could see on that, on all of these tests, amounted to forty-six cents a hundredweight. I couldn't believe it. I called back into the area and I said, can you confirm that those tests are right? He said they've been taken off the checks. The NFO paid on this butterfat test his former buyer paid on these tests. Yesterday I visited with a group from Boise, Idaho. They confirmed the same thing has been going out there. A man walked up to me in the back of this auditorium yesterday from New York and said one of his neighbors who had been with NFO, when he left his chest dropped six tenths of a point, or better, than, almost 70 cents a hundred, and the next month it dropped another tenth. And the farmer, I think, thinks it's a fact that the NFO isn't getting the top dollar. So we're terming it the big ripoff. Well, what does the big ripoff really amount to in dollars and cents? I wonder if they've really figured it out. If you look at this transparency, the amount lost per year with butterfat at 11.6 cents per pound. Take note about your production, each dairyman out there. Do you produce a thousand pounds, two, three, four, five, six, or ten? If they were only being ripped off at one tenth of a percent, at these various poundages, it would amount to four hundred and twenty-three dollars a year, up to four thousand, over four thousand, or two tenths <coughs> from eight hundred and forty-seven dollars. 
to over $8,000. Or three, from 1200 up to 2700 12000 Look as you go down what a ripoff can amount to. One man in the audience yesterday said he produced 6000 a day. How much could he be ripped off? Is it any wonder that under methods like this that we believe are happening out there, that mounting evidence is coming along, that there's a big ripoff to farmers? One young man yesterday said to me, you get down into this category, producing 3,000 pounds of milk, you're being, getting ripped off a four-wheel drive pickup truck. Now he said, if you go down a little farther, you're getting ripped off a his and a her pickup truck. <laughs> All in the same year. How much that can amount to, we simply said maybe three to four hundred million dollars a year. When I read a couple years ago that one of the major marketers of milk, one of the adversaries of NFO said they lost eight million dollars because they were out to beat the NFO and they paid more than they could trying to discouraging us from organizing and marketing through the NFO structure. Eight million dollars in one group that they borrowed to outpay. I believe they've found a way here that they felt secure in spending money but making the farmers believe that they were getting the top dollar from them. And I don't know if that three to four hundred million figure is big enough. I want to show you now the scope of what we're talking about, what we're working with. We're calling for congressional hearings. We're calling for auditing of plants on butterfat purchased and butterfat sold. We're calling for federal inspection and supervising of all testing of all milk in the United States from border to border. You're going to become a very important part of that in the next week because our structure today has us in this position. Those dots on there are the reloads. The X's are where there's accounting done. They're in offices across the United States. And there's one out here at Tualatin, Tualatin Oregon, and one up here in Portland, Maine. So you see it covers across the whole nation. The scope of our organization is where we need it now. And if you'd like to see it by states, noticing the heavy dairy producing states having more reloads than some of the others, the thing is the structure is there. And that's what Orrin Lee Staley was saying the other night. Have you heard that it's all here? It is here in the dairy department because you just heard we need 42 million pounds of milk per month, grade A milk, right in the area that you're sitting in right now, you might say, to fulfill contracts with buyers who buy milk from Maine to California and from Canada down to Texas. We're all equipped to go. We have that all set up. So what I want all of you to do now is those little packets of cards that you picked up. I don't want to find one of those cards in your billfold or your pocket one week from today. Will you promise me that? They're not going to do any good in your pocket. Will you promise you'll get rid of them to people that I tell you to? Take those cards and pass them out to the non-members of NFO and ask them to check this and say, do you, do you think there's a chance you might be ripped off? Or hand them out to the man that's a member and not participating in our program. And then one week from today when you've done that, I want you to spend a little bit of your money, 13 cents. I want you to get those cards back from that man 
or discuss with that man and tell him that you will you want him to return back to you evidence of what his test had been on his previous milk check and tell him that you will have an NFO representative help him if he'll do one thing. Ask his milk caller to draw two samples the next time that he comes in to pick up his milk. And let that milk caller take one of those samples back to his normal buyer like they always do. But tell him that you will assist him with an NFO representative or yourself to take the other sample and have it tested in a certified or independent lab where there's no need, need for anyone to cheat or not give a fair test. Can you imagine the impact you can have next week across the whole United States? And I want the names of those people where you've handed that card to them. Then I'll give you 15 days to get back to me in the national office, a letter from you again, spend 13 cents, and tell me what the results of that test was the program, the scope, and everything is here to bargain with the major companies from border to border. Thank you.